sightings. Katsu, you've been spending time in Coburg Harbor. What do you got there? Yes, uh, yesterday uh, morning, about 10 o'clock, a uh, snowy owl was parked right on the top of a light uh, pole at uh, a boat storage area. And then uh, about 1,500 Canada goose in the bay, in and out. Um, other than that, so regular uh, 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 birds at the Coburg Harbor. But uh, yeah. after that, I went to uh, Peace Park. A, among the 300 mallers, I spotted one a hooded maganser. Yeah. So that was a, uh, I thought that was a nice spot. Uh, that's about it for yesterday for me. Okay, thanks. Richard, you've got red poles all over the place. Oh yeah, this is a bird. Thing. Richard Pope. Bird seems to be anything unusual? No. But you need to turn your microphone on. Uh, I'm more days than usual. He said. <laughs> Richard, turn your 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 microphone on. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. I guess she can't hear me, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Oh, well, I can't hear Elizabeth. Uh, what is she asking me what we've seen in the area? She asked you about red poles. Oh, red poles. I know yes, you've seen a lot of red asked. poles oh. all over the place. You've seen red poles. I can't hear you, Elizabeth, but I'll, I heard you say red poles. And, uh, we have seen lots of red poles, uh, both... Margaret and I, uh, all over Northumberland, really. There are large flocks, including flocks out uh, 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 west of where you guys are along the lakeshore, which uh, had a few hoary red poles in. But the more interesting sightings were red and white winged crossbills. Most of them were around in Colbert for 10 days, mostly right around the uh, university in the division area. And, uh, but they seem to have moved on. So we've had lots of red poles. Margaret's even got one with her feeder, uh, but uh, the crossbills were more interesting because they were right in downtown Coburg. Now, I don't know whether they heard me or not. Yeah, I See, I'm not hearing any sound. We heard you, we heard you Richard. <laughs> oh, good, okay. Elizabeth? Who else, yeah, hi Anne. Hi, um, so I had a flock of 25 red poles at my feeders this morning, which is the most that I've seen. And there was a song sparrow at Gages Creek this morning. Oh, wow, that's nice. It's a nice winter bird. Unexpected. <laughs> There's Elizabeth. Jamie, what have you been having? Jamie Ingalls. Uh, well, I've had uh, pine siskins, red poles, uh, you know, some of the other winter finches, but, uh, and not really any sparrows this year, which is, I mean, other than tree sparrows, of course, so, okay. yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Another one, you had exciting birds this week? Yeah? But your mic isn't on. I can't hear Elizabeth at all. <clears throat> Um, I Im e immediately emailed Elizabeth pictures, which I thought was a red-headed woodpecker. It was a male red-bellied woodpecker, <laughs> which I was embarrassed about. <laughs> but we had the female, and she's quite dusky with that rosy bit of red on the bottom. And I hadn't seen him before, so. They are spectacular. It was, and the red belly. Yeah. Not the most obvious field mark. <laughs> but if you have a slightly older field guide, it won't be in it because as at this range, because ah. they've just in the last probably 25 years they're they've become common along around here. But before that they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, Richard? What have you had? Richard Jordan. Uh, mostly uh, seen a fair number of uh, red poles in the area in the last uh, week and uh, also uh, you know, a couple of weeks back the, the, the cross the white wing crossbills were in the neighborhood flying over my house uh, 
over uh, on the next block. And you know, so that was a pretty exciting winter for the, the cross spills. But other than that, not too much. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Richard. Tom and Jenny, you for Christina. Yeah. Anybody else does. Hi. Pardon. Yeah, we're on. Uh, we had a couple of dozen Bohemians today. Uh, but I think what's been unique about this winter is the birds that we haven't seen. So we haven't had any tree sparrows, where normally we have a dozen a day. We haven't had any pine siskins, where they're normally common, or at least not uncommon. No crossbills. So we're feeling a little bit left out in the finch world. We had a barred owl, though, a couple of nights ago, sitting on the power line just outside our street. That's nice. <laughs> and, and I had, I, I, I put it on eBird, but I had a very strange, ex we had a very strange experience in the harbor. So maybe this question for Katsu. So there was a small open area of water, maybe four or five feet in diameter at most, which had a female mallard swimming in it. And the snowy owl was sitting on the edge of the water for 30 minutes. Right beside it. Right wow. beside it. It occasionally would fly over the top of the mallard, presumably trying to drive it in the air. And eventually the snowy returned to the lighthouse and the mallard just continued to swim in its own private pond. Uh, so the question is, what was going on? Do, do oh, snowy yeah. owls not take birds off the water? Do they only take them in the air? Uh, it was like the snowy owl was afraid to get its feet wet. Maybe the owl had fed and didn't yeah. need food. They're not it's humans. Sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. This, maybe it had just fed. Maybe it didn't need it to eat anything more. Well, then it's a very cruel owl because it was driving the duck bananas. It's just harassing the <laughs> duck. <laughs> Katsu, do you know? If, if um, I agree with you. I, I think their uh, snowy owl wasn't hungry. So yes, it was a cruel for the rest of the uh, mallards. I agree that too. <laughs> Who else? I just have, I don't have everybody on here, I think. Anybody else have anything to contribute? Frank. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I like like Tom said. I I haven't had much of anything in my feeders in Coburg uh, this winter. Uh, last week, uh, a, a young lady uh, mentioned to me that there was a large flock of. Uh, she thought they were. Um, uh, I think they were Bohemian waxwings. She thought they were cedar waxwings, but I think they were probably Bohemian waxwings, from what I understand. And I think part of the reason why I don't have anything in my backyard. Uh, so much the odd morning dove, uh, the odd red-breasted, white-breasted uh, nuthatch, uh, is that I have a young uh, Cooper's hawk that pays uh, regular visits to my backyard. So that could, could explain that. Um, yeah, so that's about it. I have nothing <laughs> to offer here. Yeah. We're having the same issue, Frank. We never, we seldom see this Cooper's hawk, but it's scaring the bejesus out of everything else at the, at the feeder. So yeah. it's been a little bit thin. Everybody else has had tons of finches. On my feeder watch count last week, I had one goldfinch and one common red pole, and that was it. Hi, Elizabeth. And, and Brian, you do a feeder watch. You had something interesting lately? Robert? Um, oh, sorry. Who's going next? Robert. Okay. It Robert here. I, we have a bird at our feeder that shows up from time to time. It looks like a junco, a rise of the junco, but has very unusual coloring. It's sort of beige on its back from its, uh, the back of its wings to the tail and white the rest of the body. It, it could be a leucistic junco, uh, Robert. Maybe I should come over to your house and have a look. Maybe you should. We'll call you the next time it shows up. Do that, thank you. Uh, because it's, uh, I don't, I don't recognize it. Behaves like, as I say, it behaves like a junco, and it's on the ground feeding with the others. So, leucistic means that it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, um, 
it, it has sort of faded colors than, than, the, than the regular ones. And sometimes it's partly leucistic. It's not, it, it, it's just not a normal coloration. And once in a while, these things happen. Right. And, and Brightman. Um, well, I had a, that, I, I emailed you about it the other day. There was a sap sucker um, on my crab tree and it was either a female or an immature one. I didn't really, couldn't really tell which one, but it sat there for a long time and then it kept picking up berries and it would pick up the berries and it would like tuck them into the bark. So that was kind of a, and it, it stayed there pretty much all afternoon, but I haven't seen it again. Yeah, yeah. See, um, sapsuckers are unusual birds in the wintertime, but they do occur. We had one hanging around our feeder last year. We haven't seen any sign of it this year. And I just had an email tonight from Deb Panko, who lives in the east end of Coburg, and she's had one at her feeder as well today. So, anybody else? I guess that's it, Tim. Okay, Dave. thanks, Elizabeth. Anyway, I'm gonna, the next, uh, our next monthly meeting is uh, our AGM. And I've asked Brian Maxwell to give us a, his words of wisdom on this. Brian, take your microphone. Yeah, that's yeah. a boy. I well done. Yeah, that's, hopefully I'm still <laughs> visible. Um, so, it's just like a regular meeting for those who haven't been to an AGM before, except we have to add in about, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes worth of boring business. That will, this will be next month. We've never done this kind of meeting by Zoom, and I'm going to try and explain quickly what I think is going to happen. Uh, because we're a registered charity, um, we have a constitution, we have a board of directors and an executive. And we have to do little bits of business once a year at an annual general meeting. And this involves doing things like having motions to approve the previous year's minutes and approving the financial report, endorsing the actions of the, uh, of the executive over the past year. Normally we have the materials to support um, this at the meet, at the physical meeting. This year, we will make sure that the previous year's minutes are published in the upcoming curlew. The financial report will be in the curlew. The president's report will be in the curlew. And I urge anybody who has any questions about any of these things to raise them um, before the meeting. Uh, all the contact information uh, is in the curlew and you can contact, especially our treasurer, who can provide you any level of detail you need if you have any concerns whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we do is we are required to, I guess you could say, refresh our uh, board of directors every year. Um, we have um, an executive board, six members on the executive, six members on the board, and the maximum term for any of these positions is two years. <laughs> um, we also have a, what is called a nominating committee that's chaired by the past president, which is yours truly. And uh, we are charged with finding a slate of candidates and presenting them at the meeting for uh, endorsement or election by the, by the members. And the good news is that we have got a, I think a pretty good slate right now. We have three vacancies for directors coming up this year, we have three candidates. And they are the three candidates whose term is just expiring. So they're all experienced. Um, I will mention that if somebody is really keen to get involved, at least one of those people would step aside if somebody has a strong interest in, in getting really involved. Uh, but again, we have three candidates for that. Uh, in the executive, five of the six positions are up for a vote, or actually I should say four of six because we don't normally vote for the past president. Uh, these are the <laughs> president and the first and second VP, uh, as well as the treasurer. Now we have a candidate for treasurer who is our existing treasurer, we're very pleased to say. This is a critical role. So Dan Kelly will present himself as a candidate again. And uh, our 
first VP, uh, Frank Godfrey, is offering to stand as of this moment for president for a one-year term. And our second VP, Whitney Lake, is offering to move up to first v, uh, VP. And if this is approved, then Tim would move to past president. So the only position we still have not got a candidate for is for our second VP. This is not a major issue. Uh, we can survive without one and we can also appoint one uh, during the year when things become a little bit more clear. But if anybody is interested, uh, please get in touch with me. My contact information is in the curlew and I can tell you what is involved. Uh, normally at the AGM, at the, uh, when we have a physical meeting, we offer the opportunity for people to be nominated from the floor. This means somebody nominates somebody, somebody else seconds them. Um, we don't think we can do this efficiently uh, um, during a Zoom meeting. Uh, so we put a note in the January curlew that we will consider any nominations that are received by the secretary, that's, that's Micah, again, her contact information is in the curlew, by February 14th. This would allow us to contact candidates, make sure they know what they're getting into and would let us adjust the slate of candidates uh, if it can be done. Um, so, but to make any of this work for the business part to work, we need to have a quorum. And that means we need 25 members um, at the meeting, or I guess you could say online. Um, so to make this happen, we need to be able to identify you when you log on. So our Zoom facilitator, uh, Jamie and, and, uh, and family, uh, they will have a list of a uh, membership list. So if you can make sure that when your name shows up, that it's your full name, because he's not going to know all of you. So if, it, if you show up just as Mary, uh, we would ask you to change the display to, to your full name, for example, Mary Smith. And if you have a family membership, if there's, let's say, two of you in the family, um, all of the adults would each have a single vote. So if you can change the display to say, you know, Mary and Bob Smith. Um, Jamie can show you how to do this, either I think tonight after the, the speaker or before the next of the meeting. And then how we think we're going to do this is probably just a show of hands. Right? When we, we will have a motion proposed and then it'll be all in favor. And if you can just wave your hands or something of that effect, if that doesn't work for some reason, you can also reach uh, there, uh, via chat function, but that is something that you should explore again with the Zoom facilitator before the meeting happens. Um, if if somebody comes in and tries to attend the meeting by phone, I don't think we can make that work. So you'd have to be able to have a video connection. Um, if that is absolutely not possible and you really want to be counted, it's possible that we could put a proxy form in the curlew and have that emailed, but I'm only going to do that if somebody approaches us because it's just one more uh, thing to try and take care of. But anyhow, that's that's what I think we're going to do. We'll do it at the start of the meeting. So it'll be just after 7.30, uh, February 26th. And we'll try and make it as quick as possible. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get on with the normal meeting in 10 to 15 minutes. So I think... That is what I have to say, and uh, I can hope I haven't put everybody to sleep. Any questions? No? Well, let's move right along then. <laughs> See, Brian, you did very well as always. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Kat Lucas. Uh, she's the Aquatics Links Program Assistant at Toronto Zoo. She has a passion for uh, conservation, education, and connecting others with the environment. She graduated from the University of Guelph with a Bachelor's of Science, Zoology, and a Master's of Environmental Science with a focus on aquatic taxology and fish reproduction. Rather than put you all to sleep, I'm going to ask for further ado to have Kat to give her presentation on aquatic species at risk in the Great Lakes. Kat, welcome. 
Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And nice to see all you virtually. I think I might need Jamie to give me a co-host or host um, status here so that I can share my screen. Uh, and I will share some slides with you tonight. And then maybe about halfway through, I will switch to some models because um, I know we don't always want to just sit through slides all evening on your fun Friday night here. Uh, so I've got some fish models to show and then we'll head back to the slides to finish things off. If you've got questions though, I'm happy to take them as we go. You can throw them in the chat box or uh, raise your hand, <laughs> whether it's uh, on the Zoom function or your real hand, um, and I can take questions then. Uh, and there'll, there'll be time at the end as well. Uh, so let's see if we've got all set up. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, so we can get started here. Um, I guess when I switch back to the slide, um, to switch back to me uh, and stop the slides just um, it might be helpful to be on speaker view but we can talk about that when we get there uh, so that you can see me and the models nice and big but to get started again a little bit about me i'm the aqualinks program assistant at the toronto zoo and i've been in this role for about two years now and aqualinks is our classroom hatchery program and we're usually <laughs> at this time of year bringing uh, atlantic salmon eggs into classrooms across the city and students are raising them and watching them grow and then releasing them out into the wild in the spring this year of course is different last year was different uh, but in a good year we're releasing about 3,000 Atlantic salmon eggs. Uh, and we are starting to now see some returning adults after about 12 years of this program. Uh, but we'll talk more about the salmon later. That's just a little overview of uh, what most of my job is. And the other part of my job is doing outreach like this. Uh, I've got a couple different uh, things going on with my schooling. I did my Bachelor of Science in Zoology and then a Master's in Environmental Science uh, where I studied aquatic toxicology uh, and looking at how pharmaceuticals in our water are affecting fish reproduction. So I was specifically looking at Tylenol, which I'm sure is a kind of medicine that many of us have taken in our lives <laughs> and looking at how that is affecting uh, fish after we take the medicine, our body uses it and then excretes it. Uh, that goes down the drain into our Great Lakes. Uh, luckily, though, even at very high concentrations of Tylenol, uh, the fish were not affected, or at least my study fish weren't. Uh, so if you need to keep taking Tylenol, uh, it's no problem. You can do that without a guilty conscience. I've got certificates of environmental conservation and leadership. And back last spring, like many of us, I found I had a lot of extra time on my hands. Uh, so I actually started a certificate of community development and engagement to learn more about connecting with diverse communities. I'm bilingual, so I can do this presentation in both English and French, and we do these presentations for school groups as well. Usually we're going into the schools and meeting students there, uh, but this year, of course, it's all virtual. So my email is down there. If you've got questions about booking a um, presentation for um, a school group that you know, or if you have any questions about the presentation or just want to reach out after, there's my email. Uh, to get started, though, I would like to do a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that the land that the Toronto Zoo sits on is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and many bands of Chippewa, including the Chippewa of Georgina Island. Our First Nations people were the first stewards of this land, our first caretakers, and hopefully today during this presentation, you might learn something new and be inspired to continue to be uh, caretakers for the land as well. Here we've got a map of the Great Lakes. That star is you up uh, near Lake Simcoe this evening, but I am in Toronto. Uh, but the Great Lake that would be the closest to both of us is Lake Ontario. Then we have Lake Erie, which is the smallest of our Great Lakes. Lake Huron is up in the middle and it has the longest shoreline of any of our Great Lakes with all of those islands and the extra Georgian Bay tied in there. We've got Lake Michigan, which is the only Great Lake that's entirely in the United States of America. And up top we have Lake Superior, which is the largest of our Great Lakes. And it holds about half of all of the water in our Great Lakes. About one in four Canadians get their drinking water out of the Great Lakes. So of course we wanna protect them for all of us humans, but the Great Lakes region is also home to about 3,500 species. Uh, so that's another really great reason to protect this ecosystem. 
And here in the Great Lakes, we have so many different kinds of habitats, everything from these nice sandy beaches with big open water, which is habitat to some of our larger species. We even have lots of rivers, whether they're fast or slow. And in these rivers, um, it often uh, find species that like a little bit more movement with the water. On the other hand, we also have wetlands where the water doesn't move almost at all. And there's lots of living things that prefer that lazier lifestyle uh, in our wetlands. And then we have some rocky and cave areas up near uh, Tobermory on Lake Huron, and that offers really great habitat and hidey holes uh, to some of our, our species that might like a little more privacy. But because we have so many different habitats here, we can support so many different kinds of life. So like I said, there's 3,500 species in the Great Lakes region. And um, we have everything from insects and there's many insects that start their life in water. Things like dragonflies or mosquitoes as larvae, they, uh, they hatch as eggs into the water. And then as they grow into adults, they grow their wings and fly off. Of course, we have fishes here in our Great Lakes and that's gonna be the main topic this evening. We have crayfishes, which are like mini lobsters, reptiles like our turtles, plants, fungi, mussels, and mussels are another one that we will touch on tonight as well. And mussels, they're often overlooked, right? Uh, they're kind of boring. This guy looks kind of like a rock, uh, but I promise it's alive and they are really helpful for our ecosystems. They are filter feeders, which means that they eat things out of the water that we don't really like to see in there. Uh, things like algae and bacteria like E. coli. And then they basically spit the water out even cleaner than it was to start. Uh, so they are doing a really great ecosystem service there, keeping the water clean for us humans, as well as all the other wildlife. We have mammals like our beavers, birds, which we know lots about. I learned a little bit this evening as well. I'm trying to, to learn more about birding. So it's nice to hear some different names of birds and see what I should be expecting this time of year. And then we've also got amphibians like our frogs and toads. So, so much different diversity, biodiversity here in our Great Lakes. Uh, and it's a good reason for us to, to be worried about what's out here and how we can help. In the Great Lakes, there's over 150 different kinds of fish. We have everything from little minnows, like the red side dace, who we'll learn more about tonight, up to the largest freshwater fish that we find here in our Great Lakes, which is the lake sturgeon. And that can grow to be over two meters long. And that's another one that we'll learn a little bit more about tonight. Of these 150 species, about 20% of them are listed as at risk. So whether that's special concern, threatened, endangered, or locally extinct, uh, and all of those, um, if they, they're trending in the wrong direction, could head towards extinction, which of course we don't want to see any more of our, uh, our, of our living things go extinct. For our freshwater mussels, we have about 40 species of freshwater mussels here in our Great Lakes. Uh, and over all of Canada, there's about 50. Uh, so we actually have a freshwater mussel hotspot here in the province of Ontario because we have so many of these freshwater mussels right here. Um, and again, like I said, they are those filter feeders. They are doing us a really big favor by eating the things that we don't like to swim in or drink, uh, those bacteria and algae. And they are making that water cleaner. Of these 50 or so species that we have in Canada, 65% of them are listed as at risk. So two thirds basically of our freshwater mussels are, are listed as endangered or, or threatened. And uh, that's not good news because they are doing such great work for us. And we'll talk about some of those threats um, that they are facing today as well. But to start, we've got this lake surgeon. We'll get into some of these different fish now. Unfortunately, I do not have a full size model of a lake surgeon in my house, uh, but the, the other fish species that I'm showing tonight, I do have. Uh, but the lake surgeon, like I said, they can grow to be about two meters long. Uh, so it would be about the same size as my sofa. And they are a kind of fish that are prehistoric. So the family of sturgeon existed before and during dinosaurs. And of course we know our dinosaurs are extinct, uh, but the, these sturgeon have continued. Um, and it's pretty amazing that they've lasted that long. One way that we know how old they are or how old the species or family is, is uh, based on their skeleton is not made of bone. 
So you might be thinking of uh, an idea of what it could be made of instead. And it's the same thing that's in our ears and our noses, right? And maybe we know that is cartilage. Uh, so it's that kind of squishier, softer material that isn't quite bone. And in terms of evolution, cartilage came before bone. So that's that clue that tells us that these are prehistoric fish. You might know of another fish that is also made of cartilage and that would be the shark. Uh, but as you can see, this shark has a mouth full of very sharp teeth, uh, not something you would like to encounter in the wild. Uh, and you might now be a little bit worried about this lake sturgeon, uh, whether we need to worry about them nibbling on our toes if we're out swimming. Uh, but the good news for us is that lake sturgeon actually don't have any teeth. Uh, instead, they have these barbels, these whiskers on their chin, and those are covered in taste buds, and they are able to sift through the gravel and sand at the bottom of our lakes, and when they taste some bugs that they would like to eat, they can just slurp them up whole. So not something that's out, out to get us, even though it looks a little bit like a shark. Over the past few months, our lake sturgeon have moved from threatened up a level to endangered. Uh, so that is the wrong way that we would like to see them moving. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a couple of things that have impacted our lake sturgeon populations. One is bycatch, which is when they get caught in a net that's not meant for them. Uh, they are very large fish. So unfortunately, if there's nets put out, they can sometimes get tangled in there uh, and that would lead to their demise. Another reason is that they live a very long time. Uh, they can live to be over a hundred years old and that is a, is a long time for a wild animal. Uh, and because their life is so long, everything happens a little bit slower. So it takes about 30 to 35 years for them to reach sexual maturity. So that's 30 years to stay alive, avoid being eaten by another fish, avoid human activity, just before they can even lay their first round of eggs. When we put that in perspective, humans, we often live to be about 100 years old, but we reach sexual maturity at around 15. So it's taking twice as long for these lake sturgeon to be ready to start a family compared to humans. Another reason that lake sturgeon are endangered is because of something that some fancy people like to eat. And that fancy thing would be caviar. Uh, unfortunately, there used to be a very big market for lake sturgeon caviar here in our Great Lakes. And of course, if we're taking away these eggs, even though they're not fertilized, in theory, we're taking away opportunities for these eggs to hatch and become babies and later adults to have more, um, more offspring. So we're, we're really impacting that, the population in that way. The good news is though about 50 years or so ago, there, they, there was a ban put in on Lake Sturgeon caviar uh, for harvesting or collecting this. So the, the goal was that we by now should see some benefits uh, to these populations starting to grow again. Uh, but unfortunately, there's just so many other threats and barriers here for the Lake Sturgeon that they are inching closer and closer um, to, to extinction. Next up, we've got the red side days, and this is where I will stop sharing because I have some models here. Again, you might want to make me um, the or put the zoom into speaker view. Um, if you're on a computer, usually you can go up to the right hand corner and it says view and you can switch from gallery to speaker. Um, so that way you can see me and the models nice and big. To start, we have this little guy who was called a red side dates. You can see it's got red on its side and dace is just another word for a small fish. So you can see even as a full size adult, it's only the same size as my finger. Uh, they don't really grow much longer than 10 or 12 centimeters. They are a kind of fish that we would have uh, very close to you on Lake Simcoe as well as around the greater Toronto area. Uh, they about 80% of all of the Canadian population of red side dace is within the Lake Ontario watershed um, and the greater Toronto area. So unfortunately, they have to put up with a lot of us humans. <laughs> uh, and that is probably that is the main reason that they are endangered is because of human activity. And when we have so many humans in this concentrated area, and we're finding more than ever more humans just want to keep going to the big city rather than the country. And that often leads to more pollution and more litter. 
And these little fish, they really need clean and clear water. They are intolerant to pollution. So they do not like any changes in their water quality. Why we should care though about this little guy is that they are a carnivore who likes to eat insects and their favorite treats are things like mosquitoes. And as naturalists, I'm sure you can appreciate something that's out there eating mosquitoes for you on those summer days. To catch mosquitoes, these red side dace will actually jump right out of the water and grab them as the mosquitoes as they are flying. Uh, and they are the only kind of minnow in Canada who eats this way. So that makes them very special. But unfortunately, when we start seeing pollution and litter in the water, it makes the water very murky and dirty and all of these obstacles now. And the red side dace will usually sit at the surface and look up to see those mosquitoes. But once there are all these other things in the water, it makes it very hard for them to hunt effectively. Um, so that is why we are seeing this decline. And again, I just want to remind you, if you've got questions, of course, you can um, raise your hand or put your uh, right in the chat box and I'll keep an eye on that as well. But the next fish that I am going to introduce is the American eel. And this again is about a full size model, about a meter long. And they are another uh, kind of fish that are endangered here in our Great Lakes. And historically, they did live in Lake Ontario. However, these days, uh, their populations are really dwindling, um, uh, mostly due to human development. These guys, they do a very long migration. The American eel often does one of the longest migrations of all fish, uh, capping out at around 5,000 kilometers round trip. Wow. That's like, <laughs> I know, wow. <laughs> That is like us getting in a car and driving all the way to the Yukon and back about 500 hours of driving and they are doing it all swimming on their own. American eels do this migration to either find uh, food that they like or to breed at the, um, at the end of their life. Uh, so all American eels, no matter where they live in North America, Europe, or even um, the north end of Africa, they will all swim down to Florida. Uh, just like all of us love going down to Florida, uh, that's where they will go and they will uh, gather and spawn just off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean in an area called the Sargasso Sea. There's actually never been a, a human sighting of this actual spawning. Uh, that's how elusive these guys are, uh, but we know they go down there uh, and that's where they spawn. And at the end of this migration, they are so exhausted um, that they just spawn and then die and that is the end of their life. Because there's no parents around in the picture, uh, these little baby eels need to be ready to, to survive in this new big world. And one way that eels have adapted is that the, as the babies hatch out of their eggs, they are entirely see-through, uh, totally transparent. And that is great camouflage to avoid being eaten by any other larger fish that they might come across. In the, in the fish world in general, we don't see much parental care. Uh, so we'll talk about the salmon in a little bit, but you'll see that they're so vulnerable just hatching out of these eggs and they have to be just ready to go and off into the world. These little eels, they're called glass eels at this point because they are see-through like glass. Uh, they will start swimming uh, from Florida up the coast of North America and then start turning into our freshwater rivers. That's where they'll spend the next big chunk of their life, hanging out in the rivers where there's lots of food for them. And they will be starting by eating lots of insects, aquatic insects, uh, until they grow a little bit bigger and then they'll start introducing more fish into their diet. Once they are full size like this guy, they turn right back around and go back down to Florida on the way back, they usually just have a one track mind. They just wanna get down to Florida and, and to spawn. So often they don't eat at all and they actually let their digestive tract start to break down. Uh, so just letting it deteriorate. So it's one less thing to fuel. Uh, and then they're just on their way. As I said, they are endangered and that is because of things that are blocking their migration. Uh, so, so it started off uh, with things like lumber mills and pulp mills on the Ottawa River, which was home to uh, like one of the main hotspots for American eels. Uh, and then it continued to grow human, develop, um, human development into more hydroelectric dams and other large barriers. 
unfortunately, it gave them a really hard time uh, to get where they needed to go. However, one really cool thing about American eels that is a very helpful adaptation for these barriers uh, is that they can breathe in water like a fish. Of course, they've got gills, but they can also breathe on land. And when they breathe on land, they can wiggle up kind of like a snake. And then they produce lots of mucus all over their body. And once they are coated in this mucus, they can actually breathe through their skin. And that is wonderful because it means they can get up, move around some of these barriers and then hop back in the water on the other side. Unfortunately, some, some hydroelectric dams are way too big for this little guy to get around, uh, but we'll hear about some of the uh, human inventions that have helped our eels get around um, and other migratory species too. Still no questions, but again, just a reminder <laughs> there if you'd like. The next fish I've got here tonight is an Atlantic salmon. And again, this is a full size model. Atlantic salmon are a fish that is considered locally extinct in our Great Lakes. Uh, the big word for that is extirpated. Uh, and that just means that they used to be here, but they don't exist anymore in this area. However, as many of us have eaten Atlantic salmon, uh, we know that there's still lots out there all in the Atlantic Ocean. However, our very cool landlocked population in Lake Ontario no longer really exists. For thousands of years, our First Nations people sustainably harvested these Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario. However, when our first settlers came in, uh, they said, wow, look at all of these salmon and very quickly overfished them down to nothing. And so for the past 200 years, um, there's been, well, maybe, maybe closer to the past 50 years, uh, there's been many conservation initiatives trying to bring these Atlantic salmon back to Lake Ontario. So I talked about the program we have at the zoo, but we're also partnered with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, to bring these salmon back. Uh, so as a whole, with all of these groups, we've got tens of thousands of Atlantic salmon babies being released every year, and we are starting to see those returning adults. Atlantic salmon have a very interesting life cycle. They start their life as an egg like most fish do. And they, um, these are some fake salmon eggs, but they're about the same size as a green pea. And they're usually bright orange or bright red. And we will see some pictures when we get back to the slides to check in on some of the things I've talked about. From there, they hatch into what we call an alvin. And it's about a centimeter long and it has a big orange sac on its body and this is called a yolk sac and it's very similar to the yellow part of a chicken egg where it has all of this nutrients. For the little salmon their parents aren't looking out for them so they need to find a way to feed themselves for these first six months and to do that they have this yolk sac uh, and it has all of the nutrients they need just like a little built-in fridge and they can go hide in the gravel and avoid being caught by other fish until they and uh, grow and absorb all of these nutrients and then they can go off and catch their own food after about six months or so. Once they fully absorb that yolk sac, we call them a fry and that's kind of the same size as a little French fry about an inch long or so. And at this point, they're ready to catch their own food and they can start growing pretty fast. In just a few years, they will get to this size here, which is a smolt. And this is kind of like the teenager of the salmon world. This is when they say, I'm done living at home. I'm off to see the world. And they start their migration. Up until this point, they would have been in our freshwater rivers. However, now they're ready to go find more food. So they will start their migration. And our Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario would just swim out to Lake Ontario but our Atlantic salmon that live on the coast would go straight out to the ocean. In these bigger bodies of water, it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, so they get to eat lots and grow pretty quickly again. So this, and they'll grow from our smolt to a full-sized adult in about three to five years. And once they are full-sized, they say, I'm ready to start my family. So they turn back around and swim uh, to their freshwater rivers where they, uh, were, where they hatched themselves. The Atlantic salmon that we had in Lake Ontario, they wouldn't be doing as long as a migration as the Atlantic salmon that live 
on the coast. Uh, if they're just going up to like Credit River in Mississauga, that could just be a 20 kilometer migration, uh, which is nothing when we think about those eels. And because it's a shorter migration, they actually don't die after um, returning to spawn. And they can go back and forth for many years and spawn multiple times unlike our Pacific or the Atlantic salmon that are on the coast. Uh, so that is very special about this population that we have here. And that's why we're pretty hopeful that they can, they will reestablish here in our Great Lakes. All right, I don't see any questions, but I'm gonna hop back to the slides now. Uh, but again, don't let that stop you from asking questions. Here, we're back to see our red side dace. We can see that bright red on their side and they're eating those mosquitoes for us. Then we've got our American eels and we see that glass eel, um, just that little baby one, uh, and you see how small it is and how see-through um, and, and that's great for their uh, camouflage. Then we've got Atlantic salmon. We can see along the side, the right side, the pictures of their different life stages. So we see the eggs at the top and those little black dots that you see in the eggs are actually their eyes. So even at this point in the, their development, they've already grown their eyes before hatching. Then below that, we see the alvin and that big yolk sac full of nutrients for it. And then the one below would be the fry where it's fully absorbed. Another fish that we have here in our Great Lakes that is endangered is the spotted gar. And they are a very interesting looking fish with this long beak like nose, lots of teeth in there. And uh, all of those teeth are very helpful because they are an ambush predator and a carnivore. Uh, an ambush predator means that they will kind of hide out and wait. And when they see something they wanna eat, they will jump out and grab it. So that's uh, very helpful for these guys uh, as they are also nocturnal. So they're using all of the shadows and darkness uh, to their advantage during their hunting. The main reason they are endangered though is because of habitat destruction. Uh, so we're losing this vegetation, uh, which often creates cover for them to hide and um, wait and catch their prey. Uh, but these plants are also very important for keeping sediments on the ground. So when we start losing our plants, uh, the sand and the, um, the clay at the bottom of our bodies of water can get stirred up and fish like the spotted gar they rely heavily on their vision to catch their prey. So if all of a sudden the water is really murky and unclear, then it's very hard for them to, um, to eat. Um, I see a question about um, the decline of pulp mills in Ottawa River um, and whether there's hope for the eel to reestablish there. And I think that is the that is the hope uh, because those pulp mills and lumber mills, um, they were, they've been around for maybe about 100 years or so, right? Uh, and we're hoping that as some of those start to be decommissioned, uh, then the eels will find adequate habitat in there. Um, and often the eels would use Ottawa River River to get into Algonquin Park, uh, which of course is a, a very safe place for many of our, our wild animals. Uh, so hopefully if Ottawa River can get a little bit more reestablished, then the eels can move back in and get where they need to go. And then we'll switch it up here and we'll talk about the Northern Riffle Shell. Uh, and this is a kind of freshwater mussel that we have here in our Great Lakes and would be found uh, around us in the greater Toronto area and up near Lake Simcoe as well. This little guy is only about an inch long, which is on the shorter side or smaller side of our freshwater mussels. Some can get as large as your hand, uh, but this little guy, not too big. They are in the same family as snails, so they have a hard exterior shell and a squishy living thing on the inside. And they, like I mentioned earlier, are filter feeders. So they are cleaning the water as they eat, eating things like algae and bacteria like E. coli, uh, which is wonderful for us and wonderful for them too, because they, they are being fed. This little one can filter about nine liters of water in an hour. Uh, so we can just imagine how much water one of our bigger muscles might be filtering as well. 
They are endangered though because of the invasive zebra mussels. Uh, so those are those small, much smaller shells that we have here, mussels that we have here. And they are out competing our native mussels for food and for habitat space. And we will talk a little bit more about zebra mussels and a few other invasive species a little bit later. But we talked about some of these threats here, but we'll quickly go over them again. We have things like habitat destruction, whether it's from farming or urban sprawl or urbanization where our farms, our cities keep getting bigger to try and accommodate so many humans that they're spreading right into our, our natural spaces. Overfishing isn't as big as an issue as it used to be here in the Great Lakes because there's much more policy and regulations surrounding how much we can fish, whether it's commercial or recreational. We've got our hydroelectric dams that are these big barriers. Um, however, we've also started working towards um, making sure our fish can get through, whether we have things like a fishway, which is almost like a water slide that the fish can use. Sometimes we see a fish ladder, which are stairs that a fish can jump up and over. And then we've also got pollution here in our Great Lakes, which is something that is a, a pretty big threat that we're really trying hard to, to fix these days. Uh, but we see things like our single use plastics that aren't making it into the garbage or recycling and are now entering our natural bodies of water. And we also see things like runoff where after a rain or a snow event, uh, the, the melted water or melted snow or the rain can carry things um, that it runs into, into our sewers and into our natural bodies of water. In the city, we often see things like gasoline, as well as at this time of year, lots of road salts. And there are places in the greater Toronto area that um, they, they found the water is as salty as the ocean after all of this snow melt carrying these road salts. So it's important to think about how much road salts we really need. A good rule of thumb is only about one tablespoon per meter squared. Um, so you can really think about how much we need to put out there. And another big set of threats to our um, native freshwater species would be the invasive species. And these are living things that have come from somewhere else and now they are causing problems to our native species. I'm just gonna talk about the animal invasive species tonight, but of course there's also lots of plant invasive species, uh, but that'll be, <laughs> that could be a whole other presentation. <laughs> But to start, we've got sea lamprey, and those are those two black snake-like things hanging on to our trout here. And they are hanging on using this mouth that's about the size of a tunie, filled with very sharp teeth. They latch onto the fish and they will suck the fish's blood, kind of like a vampire, kind of like a leech. Uh, but a leech, of course, is um, more closely related to insects than to fish, and this guy here is definitely a fish. They can suck the fish's blood until it either dies or it might fall off early and then they can have a big infected wound, um, which uh, can often lead to death as well. As we can see from their name, they are saltwater kind of fish, uh, but they made their way into our Great Lakes with the help of the man-made canal systems and they were kind of like, oh, I don't like it's not salty enough for me, but look at all this food. I'll probably hang around for a bit. The good news is though, is that they are under control here in our Great Lakes, so they are not considered as big as a threat as they used to be. And that is because our government, as well as conservation groups, are going out to where they know the sea lamprey like to spawn, and they just scoop them out and don't put them back. Uh, so that is a great way to manage them. Usually the number one question I get during these presentations is, is this going to get me? And the easy answer is no. Uh, they prefer cold-blooded uh, cold blooded animals like our fish, and we are warm-blooded as humans. However, maybe you're feeling extra strong these days. Maybe you have a lot of time on your hands and you decide you want to swim across Lake Ontario. You are going to be swimming for 40 hours at least uh, just to get a across. And as you swim, your body temperature will drop and it will drop enough to confuse these sea lamprey. So there are stories of these long distance swimmers who have to stop, yank them all off and keep going. But of course they are wearing a wetsuit. They're not in a tiny swimsuit here. And of course we have hands. Uh, so that makes it much easier for us humans. 
Also, back last February, I had the opportunity to have a sea lamprey suck on my hand. And in my line of work, you have to say, okay, I will do that. Uh, <laughs> even though it was uh, a little bit creepy, uh, the sea lamprey sucked on my hand for about 10 seconds and then it said yuck and I said yuck and it fell off and I have lived to tell the tale. So I am not worried about running into a sea lamprey here in the Great Lakes. That's not gonna stop me from swimming. I did see a question come through, so I'll check that out. How do fish adapt to change from fresh to salt water? That is a, a very difficult thing for a fish to do. Uh, so it is surprising that the sea lamprey manage that, uh, but it is it requires a lot of regulation of of their body, um, the amount of water in their body, uh, because if they're in salt water, uh, most of their their body fluids will want to leave and get towards the saltier water to equal things out. Kind of like how if we go in a bathtub, if we sit in there for a really long time, uh, we start to get raisins on our hands and toes. And that's just the water that's in the bathtub trying to move into our bodies where there's less water. Uh, and that's why it, we kind of start to see those raisins as our, our body expanding a little bit there. However, um, it is very difficult for a fish to do this. So both the salmon and the, Amer the Atlantic salmon and American eel, they are, their bodies are well built to do this change. Something like the sea lamprey probably just had this adaptation in there and was just very tolerant to different amounts of salt. Um, so that's how they've, they've managed. Uh, but for, for many fish, it wouldn't be an easy transition. Then next up we have our zebra mussels and those are those smaller mussels that are attached to the big one on the left. And you can see that some of them have that characteristic stripe on them, which is how they got their name. Zebra mussels came over here from Russia in the 1980s. They were on some cargo ships, uh, and when you have cargo, you load it onto the top of these ships, and then you fill this interior tank called a ballast tank with water to help keep the, the boat balanced uh, so it's not too top heavy. Once you get to your destination, they offloaded all this cargo, and then they dumped this tank of water because they wanted to have a lighter boat to have a faster trip back to Russia. However, they didn't realize that there were all of these hitchhikers getting this free cruise uh, and they are now spread through our Great Lakes. They, uh, unfortunately, we do not have a, a good way to manage them just yet. And they are just great at covering everything, right? They'll cover this other freshwater mussel. They'll cover the motors of boats, docks, beaches. They don't care, they love it. And they are a problem for our freshwater mussels because they are out eating them and uh, taking out their habitat space as well. So they just aren't finding good spots to live anymore. But they are also not so great for us humans because they have really sharp shells. And if you step on them, they can easily cut your foot, uh, which makes it so important to wear those stylish water shoes that we all love to wear. Uh, so they are not so great for us humans and we don't know how to control them just yet. The good news is, is that they haven't spread all the way across Canada yet. So they've gotten about as far west as Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba. And over on the border of British Columbia and Alberta, they've actually trained sniffer dogs to sniff for zebra mussels on uh, boats that are coming in on trailers. And these dogs are doing a really great job. They can find the zebra mussels and then we can properly clean and disinfect these boats before they get into British Columbia. Also, before the holidays, I was reading an article that was saying um, down in Michigan, they're starting some new research there, looking at adding copper to the water. And in their study sites, they were finding that the copper was killing 90 to 95% of the zebra mussels. Uh, so there, I don't think this is a hopeless situation. I think that we will get them under control probably in the next decade or so. Uh, and definitely more research to come. And, and I think... Uh, <laughs> There is hope. I see another question coming in through here. What controls zebra mussels? So hopefully, Cheryl, I was able to answer that. Is that right now nothing does? Uh, so unfortunately, it's a, a, a tough situation. 
though there are reports of, of some fish that will eat them, including some other invasive fish that are now here that are eating them, things like round gobies. I've heard some people say um, that they think the round gobies will eat the zebra mussels. Uh, but of course, that's a, another invasive species that shouldn't be here that is controlling another invasive species. So not quite a win-win there, uh, but possibly <laughs> an area for more research. And then another species or another group of species that we have here in our Great Lakes are Asian carp. Mm -hmm. And there are four different carp that fit into this category. That would be uh, silver carp, which we have on the left, black carp on the right, um, big headed carp and grass carp as well. All of these Asian carp were brought here intentionally, whether it was for aquaculture and raising um, them in aquaculture tanks. Mm -hmm to grow uh, plants or other kinds of um, other, I guess, plants really. And then we've also brought them here for our decorative ponds. Uh, people were looking for alternatives to koi and goldfish. So they thought the carp would make a, a nice change. And unfortunately, even though they were in these secluded aquaculture ponds or decorative ponds, after a lot of severe weather events, um, many of them managed to escape and made it into our Great Lakes. Uh, and unfortunately, carp can be very disruptive in ecosystems. So something like the black carp likes to eat aquatic insects and they will dig around the roots of our aquatic plants, stir up all the sediments like our sand and our um, clay that are on the bottom and pull up those plants and the water becomes just very murky, making it difficult for our fish that need to see uh, to catch their prey and they, they can't find food anymore. And so these guys here, luckily though, we've got another good news story though, uh, because there are no self-sustaining populations of Asian carp in our Great Lakes. Uh, so that means that again, we've got our, our government as well as conservation groups who go where they know these um, fish want to gather and breed scoop them up, don't put them back. And uh, that has been very successful so far. On the left, we've got a, a picture of these silver carp that are jumping. And if you are, are looking for a laugh on YouTube, there are many videos that show the carp jumping up out of the water when they are scared. Uh, so if you're looking for something funny to watch, you can check that out. But now that we've learned about some of the really wonderful species that we have here and, and some of the threats that they're facing, what can we now do as individuals to make a difference? One thing we can do is to conserve water, right? So we don't wanna waste water if we're not using it. When we're brushing our teeth, we can easily turn off the tap until we're ready to rinse. These days we're washing our hands more than ever. Of course, we wanna stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, but again, we don't need to leave the tap running when we're lathering, uh, we turn it off and then when we're ready to rinse, we'll turn it back on. Also, it's January. Uh, maybe you're thinking of some New Year's resolutions that you would like to incorporate into your life. And maybe one idea would be to try and take shorter showers. A good shower length would be about seven minutes or so. Uh, so you can have a think about how long your own shower is and what, what are some ways that you might be able to bring that down. As field naturalists, I'm sure you have seen what litter can do to the environment and to ecosystems. And uh, of course, we don't want to be litter bugs. Uh, so we can try to make sure that we do not cause any litter. And maybe if we're out in nature and we see some litter and it's safe to pick it up, we can grab it and get it out of these ecosystems. On the other side too, we also want to be careful about what goes down the drain. Uh, so there are many things that don't belong there. Our sinks, our toilets, our tubs, they're all connected to our sewers, which are connected to our Great Lakes. So things like expired medicine don't go down the drain. They should be returned to our pharmacies. We also want to be careful, like I said, about road salts earlier. Our sewers, again, are connected to our Great Lakes. So we'll be a little more careful about how much road salt we put out and check it with temperatures as well, because under or over certain temperatures outside, the road salt isn't going to be effective. So there's no reason to put it out if it's not actually going to do its job. Another thing that's coming up 
recently is microplastics, tiny pieces of plastic that are getting down our drains and into our local waterways. And that can often be things as, as simple as glitter, uh, whether you've got a bath bomb and doing a fancy uh, bath day, uh, and there's little pieces of glitter in there that get washed down the drain and into our Great Lakes. Uh, and they're now finding that fish and birds have been eating these small pieces of plastic. We know our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've got two new layers to add on top here. We've got rethink, which is about reflecting on the activities we do every day, the products we use every day, and really think about whether those are good for the environment. And maybe if they're not, we think of some ways that we can make some positive change. We've also got refuse, which is about saying no to those things that are bad for the environment and try to avoid um, uh, increasing our ecological footprint. So maybe next time you're getting fast food, they offer you plastic straw or plastic cutlery. You say, no, thank you. Uh, you don't need that. And you can either be prepared with your own or just wait till you get home. Way at the bottom now we have recycling. And that is because unfortunately, new research is showing that only about 9% of what we put in our blue bin is getting recycled at the end of the day. That means about 90% of the things that we put in there, we are wishfully recycling and that actually ends up in landfill. Some of the reasons uh, that things will go to landfill instead would be due to contamination. Things like the yogurt container. It's not showing you the same as that, is it? Things like yogurt containers or peanut butter containers need to be fully cleaned and empty before putting them in the blue bin. Otherwise, they will often throw them out uh, when they get to the sorting facility. The good news is, is that we are going to get a brand new blue bin program in 2022 from our provincial government. Uh, so there is some hope there looking forward to seeing what we come up with and hoping for, for the best there. Um, and hopefully there, there will be some more education component as well so that we can all learn how to better recycle too. And another thing we can do, um, I'm sure we're all of age to vote, uh, so we can vote for things that we value, but we can also use our dollar to vote and be an informed consumer and purchase things that uh, are in line with our own values. Next time you're out at the grocery store looking to buy some seafood, you can pull up the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide. They have an app, as well as the Vancouver Aquarium has OceanWise, uh, which is a similar program. And both of these will help you make better choices finding sustainably harvested seafood. Um, and that way you can buy things that have a, a better um, environmental footprint. There's also some new research that shows that every time we wash our clothes, little threads are falling off, going down the drain and into our natural bodies of water. This is a problem because these days, a lot of our clothing is made with plastic. Uh, if you check the labels and you see things like acrylic or polyester, that's just code for plastic. Uh, and unfortunately, that means these little threads are going uh, into our Great Lakes. And again, they're finding that birds and fish are eating these little pieces of plastic. There are some things we can do, though, uh, to make a difference at the individual level. Something we can buy is uh, um, a garment bag called a guppy bag, G-U-P-P-Y bag. And basically, it's uh, just a big mesh bag. You throw your clothes in there. Things like workout clothes are often made with polyester because polyester doesn't smell too bad and dries pretty quickly, which of course we want for our workout clothes. Uh, but you throw them in the bag, zip it up, put it in your wash just like normal, and the water can get through the bag, but these tiny threads can't get out. Um, so that's one thing we can do. We can also check those labels next time we're buying clothes and try to look for other options that have more natural fibers. We can also try to buy less and take some pressure off of these clothing companies to stop making so much new clothes constantly uh, because polyester is often cheaper than cotton. So that's why when they wanna keep pushing out new clothes, they will often go for the cheapest option. And we can buy secondhand and extend the life of clothes that are already um, that already exist. And that will help as well to take more pressure off of these clothing companies. 
Hopefully today I sparked some interest about freshwater mussels that we have here in our Great Lakes. And I'd like to let you know that the Toronto Zoo has partnered with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, our federal government, to build an app called Clam Counter, which helps you identify freshwater mussels that you might come across while you're out and about. Uh, and basically it's got like a questionnaire, lots of pictures to show you identifying features of these mussels. And you're actually able to submit your finding at the end. And that way um, there are scientists at the Toronto Zoo as well as at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans can use this data to help better inform conservation work uh, so that we can make sure we know where these freshwater mussels are and how to best protect their habitat. Uh, so that's something you can download on your smartphone. And to end things off, I would like to just acknowledge all of the wonderful partners that we work with. Um, and we wouldn't be able to have such an impact if we didn't have uh, so much of this collaboration with like minded groups, uh, whether they're other conservation groups, um, academic institutions or our government partners um, to get all of this wonderful conservation work and ed education out to um, our, our uh, communities. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight and spending your Friday night with me. Uh, I, we do have some social media pages, including a Facebook page, if you're interested in uh, following us on any of those. Uh, but if, um, and then I've got my email that I put at the beginning, but you can also reach out to Tim. Uh, if you have questions and want to reach out to me, he can forward that along. Uh, and I'm happy to take some questions now. Anybody? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That, that was great. Hi. It really was. Jim. I can't see. Okay. Cheryl, yeah, yep. go ahead. Um, I didn't get to finish when I that accidentally sent the question about I was wondering my question was going to be what uh controls the zebra mussels in Russia? And oh, in Russia, have yeah. <laughs> right, because they're, they wouldn't be invasive there. <laughs> and you're right. And no. that's often, um, it's just different bodies of water. Uh, and they might, like, that would be a native species there. And they might not have other native mussels uh, in Russia. So this would be <laughs> the one and only, and they would be able to, to take over and not have a problem. And, and that's okay, because they, they would be doing that ecosystem service of cleaning the water in Russia. And they're just, there aren't other freshwater mussels to fight with. But the issue is that they're now here in our fresh water where we have 40 kinds um, that aren't zebra mussels uh, who would be able to do this wonderful job of cleaning the water for us if right. the zebra mussels uh, weren't here. And are they edible at all? They are, are they? they are so small. Um, I don't want to see. They have like lots of models can... near me. Um, yeah, I guess they're too small. I don't see my zebra mussel models, uh, but they are they are very small. They're about a centimeter long, uh, so they yeah. wouldn't really be food, especially for us humans. We generally don't eat freshwater mussels. We will eat saltwater oh, mussels okay. instead, since they pick up that saltiness um, living in the ocean. Uh, but something like a raccoon would likely be eating um, our freshwater mussels, whether they're our native ones or invasive species. Right. But they'll eat yeah. anything, so... <laughs> Hi, I have a question, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything being done to help the sturgeon? I think that would be a huge loss to lose them. Yeah, um, and they, they have high cultural significance too to Indigenous peoples, uh, so it would definitely be a very big loss. Um, and right now, because they're endangered, it's it would be illegal to catch them. Like if you're fishing, you catch and release only. And they are doing lots of research to try and figure out like how many are even left because they are so large. They, they really like um, Lake Superior and, and our Northern Great Lakes um, because they're much colder and um, much more space there as well. And there's also concerns about climate change and, and what might happen um, to these our colder water lakes up north and whether that might have an impact on the lake sturgeon as well. Uh, but as of right now, I, I'm not sure if they're doing any breeding and releasing programs and trying to um, stock those or support those populations as well, uh, but definitely a lot of research and <laughs> um, policy surrounding whether or not um, you can catch them and, and they are protected. Who would know the answer to that question about the breeding? And I, breed I bet it would be on the provincial government website. Okay. So they have a whole website dedicated to Ontario species at risk, um, and that might have some more details about um, how, the or the, how the lake sturgeon are being supported. Thanks very much. 
Any other questions? No, the no. effects of recreational fishing on our fish. And I think the, the, the effects are likely minimal compared to our commercial fisheries. So uh, we, we do have issues with ghost nets where um, when sometimes the, the nets get knocked off our, our commercial fishing boats or, or just get left behind. And unfortunately, they're, they're such large nets that they just tangle and uh, end up just catching lots of fish and they're just not collected again. So they're just uh, all of this plastic fishing net is sitting in our Great Lakes. Um, so that's probably a, a bigger threat than our, our recreational fishing. Um, but again, things like fish hooks and, and fishing line is also another kind of pollution and litter that's entering our Great Lakes. And uh, it, it's hard to remove it. Like it, it's built to be see-through in water, whether it's nets or the, the fishing line. Uh, so it is hard to remove it once it's out there. Uh, but there are lots of, of groups that are trying to, to collect some of this deeper water litter too. And I know last year in Kingston, they did a, a big dive day where a bunch of divers volunteered uh, to go down and collect litter off uh, the coast, um, <laughs> the coast, I guess, of Kingston, Ontario, right near their new pier. Uh, so they wanted to try and get some of these, these more unlikely pieces of litter that often are much farther from shore, deep underwater that we're not really thinking about, and pull them up and out of the water. Uh, but there's lots of, of uh, regulations can, around recreational fishing. So in terms of like quotas and things like that, um, they're not able to take all that many fish. It's, and um, it's also controlled during, uh, dur during certain times of year, whether it's spawning time or not, uh, as well as size of the fish to make sure that many of the fish are able to spawn at least once uh, before a recreational angler can uh, take it. Do some waterfowl eat zebra mussels? Uh, I don't know about that for sure. Um, I guess a lot of our freshwater mussels would like our native ones would be too big for our native birds to eat or waterfowl to eat. Um, so I'm not sure whether um, whether they might have an easier time eating a zebra mussel compared to some of our native ones. Do Atlantic salmon compete with other salmon species in Lake Ontario? Uh, so these ones would be our only native uh, species of salmon in our great in Lake Ontario. Uh, so the opposite might be more true where our, uh, our stock species of uh, salmon might have a uh, might be competing with the native ones, uh, but it's still a little bit early to tell because we're not sure about how they interact together. Uh, the Pacific salmon were started to be introduced after the Atlantic salmon uh, were considered locally extinct. Um, so the adults haven't necessarily interacted <laughs> together before. Uh, so there's probably some more research that will go on there to determine uh, whether they continue to keep stocking Pacific salmon in our Great Lakes uh, once Atlantic salmon are reestablished, but that so uh, probably a, a, a many years out to, to make some decisions there. I have a question if I might. Um, mm -hmm. Please feel free. What's the status of the smelt in uh, Lake Ontario? It used to be a major social, uh, social event that the smelt run. It involved a lot of beer apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so smelt, smelt I believe. <laughs> Uh, smelt are, are one that I think are, are suffering from the introduction of invasive species. Uh, so things like alewife uh, have come here and they've um, basically taken the niche. They've taken that ecosystem spot of our smelt. Uh, I, I think they might be back coming up again, but I, I'm not too sure. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I did some research uh, in a job um, in Lake Erie and, and smelt was one that we were hoping to see more of. Um, and I don't know what the status is there either, but um, we were finding them not in as big as populations as we would have hoped, but I think uh, there is a chance that they might start reestablishing and, and growing again. Here, here. Any other questions? You, uh, I'll do one more. Since you mentioned research in Lake Erie, um, I read something indicating that agricultural runoff was uh, was causing a major change in oxygen levels and temperature, et cetera, in, in Lake Erie. Uh, what's the reality? 
Uh, so Lake Erie is definitely uh, a lake that is having a tough time. Um, for a while, it was cl it was classified as dead uh, because it, it, of those low oxygen levels, it wasn't really able to support much life. Uh, and a lot of that oxygen problem was due to the algae blooms. Uh, so there's usually algae in our, our fresh water. However, with the runoff coming off of agricultural sources, it has uh, lots of fertilizer in there, which of course we put on our, our crops to make our crops grow nice and big. Um, they are our crops are plants and so is algae. Uh, so when the water was running off of our agricultural fields, uh, entering our local bodies of water, the algae was benefiting from this fertilizer as well. Uh, so there are parts of Lake Erie that are that see these huge algal blooms and they often have toxic algae in them uh, which is unsafe for humans as well as our pets often they have to put signs up and say don't let your dogs in the water because um, these these toxic algaes have actually um, ended up killing dogs who swam in the water it's, uh, it's gonna be a, a tough go, I think, still in, in terms of being able to regulate how much farms put out. Uh, and I know maybe with uh, more organic agriculture coming in the future and people trying to opt more that way, that might change things. Uh, but Lake Erie, especially since it's the smallest lake, it feels those impacts so heavily, um, whereas some of the larger lakes, like Lake Ontario does have some agriculture around it, although mostly human, um, mostly at cities, uh, but it still does have um, this agricultural runoff as well. Um, I don't know if you can still get it on the newsstands or wherever you buy um, <laughs> National Geographics, uh, but this uh, December issue was such an amazing read um, so much details about what's facing each of our Great Lakes, talks about those invasive species, talks about the algal, algal blooms in Lake Erie. Uh, so even I learned something, uh, but that's uh, the National Geographic December issue. And I believe you can access it online for a subscription fee as well. But um, if you're interested in learning more and, and more specifics too about all of these different issues, it was definitely a great resource. Anybody else? Any questions? Any more questions? No. Okay. Kat, thank you so much. That was uh, that was fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> I know it sounds like you guys are real birders, so I hope uh, <laughs> you no? can learn something new about fish. And maybe next time you're out close to uh, the waterfowl, you're thinking a little bit about what else is in there. No, we always do. We always do. Anyway, I want to thank everybody that turned in and tuned up for this. And I apologize for people that had trouble getting on to us. But anyway, uh, I want to close this meeting uh, for the first meeting of 2021 and uh, say good night to you all. And thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next month for the annual general meeting.